to uh, Jeremiah chapter 29. We'll continue our study together of this prophet that brings uh, messages of, of judgment, uh, but also bring messages of hope. And uh, so really excited about uh, the, the text this morning and, and uh, seeing what God has to say uh, to us through it. Uh, Mom and Dad uh, have been away for a few days. Um, they escaped to an undisclosed location, and uh, <clears throat> they're celebrating their uh, 39th wedding anniversary, and, and uh, so they're, they're away for, for some days and, and actually headed out Wednesday or Thursday, I'm not sure. I think Wednesday, and, and we'll be back, obviously, um, a little bit later today. It'll be my mom's week to, to take care of our grandmother, and so they will be in uh, later today, and, and I think they've had a great time. Maybe uh, we're given a cabin at, at Camp David or something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure. No, I'm teasing. Um, I think they're down in Tennessee somewhere, and so... Um, uh, my dad wanted me, he just sent me a simple text this morning. He said, tell the church I love them. And so that's from your pastor, all right? Um, uh, we're going to look at Jeremiah 29. I don't know about you, but uh, I, I was very tempted in, in light of the heaviness of this book. I thought, man, uh, dad's not here. Uh, we might just jump to chapter 52 and wrap this thing up, you know? Uh, but uh, I, thought, I thought, I better, thought I better not, and so uh, we find ourselves in, uh, in Jeremiah chapter uh, 29. As I was preparing this week, um, I came across a thought that I've, I've, I've stewed on uh, for the last few days, and it's this simple thought that God's word is always accompanied by his presence. And I think about that um, because it's different. That's fundamentally different than my word. I thought about uh, the many times that, that I travel uh, in, in this season of our life without my family and, and thinking about being in West Africa and having the chance to, to FaceTime my family where they can hear my words, but it's not the same, right? Because I'm not there with them. But that's very different with God. John chapter 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so as we open the bread of life this morning, man, just let that settle on your heart, that God's Word is always accompanied by God's presence. And this is a privilege that we have this morning, not to just read His Word, but to be with Him and to have Him speak to us. Let's, let's pray and then we'll start in verse 1, okay? God, we love you. We thank you so much for who you are. And uh, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that the few minutes that we have now to open your Word that you would speak to us and that we would have ears to hear. Lord, if you don't speak to anyone else this morning, and I believe you will, but if you weren't, I, I pray, God, that you would speak to me, that you would convict my heart, that you would, that you would do whatever is necessary in my life to make me more like Jesus. Lord, we need you, and uh, Lord, we come to you as a church family this morning asking you to uh, to feed our souls with the bread of your word. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 29, let's pick up in verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. You remember our context, right? God has been warning his people over and over and over again through Jeremiah that if they refused to repent, that there would be consequences and that he would use Babylon as a means by which to bring discipline on his people. And so we find ourselves in Jeremiah chapter 29, and God is, is giving his words to Jeremiah to be sent to his people, some of which have already been taken captive out of Jerusalem and exiled to Babylon. Verse 2, this was after the king Jeconiah and the queen 
mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. Jeremiah is giving us a little bit of um, uh, context here for, for when this actually happened. Let me just sort of paint this quick picture that may help, help us sort of see this. Um, just a few years before um, Jeremiah wrote this, Babylon had kind of uh, made their first invasion into Jerusalem and had taken out some captives to Babylon. And this is when this is when Daniel and his friends and some of the best and brightest of Jerusalem was taken out to Babylon. And then what he tells us here in, in verse 2, this was after King Jeconiah, what this indicates is that this is actually after the second invasion of Babylon into Jerusalem, so they've actually taken out a second wave of exiles, and included in this second wave of exiles was guys like Ezekiel and, and some of those some of those people. So, so as we as we look at the letter this morning, which in earnest begins in verse four, Jeremiah is speaking to God's people that are no longer in Jerusalem, but are in exile in Babylon. And it includes guys like Daniel and Ezekiel. Those are part of the audience that, that Jeremiah is, is speaking to. In fact, J. Vernon McGee says this. He said, I have a notion that as a young man in his teens, before he was carried off into exile, Daniel listened to Jeremiah in Jerusalem. Ezekiel was also a young man when he was taken captive, and he too had probably heard Jeremiah. So it begins to kind of put some puzzle pieces together because we think about the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel. These were prophets that God used, and they were young men during the ministry of Jeremiah, right? Right? And just so we know, and we won't spend much more time at all on sort of the historical context, but there's still a sizable population left in Jerusalem. Not everybody has been taken captive, but after Jeremiah speaks these words, it's only going to be about 10 years later when Babylon will come in for the last time and completely level Jerusalem and take remaining captives to Babylon. In fact, so you can sort of... You can sort of see uh, the um, hopelessness of the people uh, of, of, of Jerusalem that find themselves in exile in a foreign land in Psalm 137. Check this out. I think it's on the screen. Beside the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. You see that? I mean, these are the exiles that Jeremiah is talking to in chapter 29. This is what they're feeling as expressed in Psalm 137. We sat and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. We put away our harps, hanging them on the branches of poplar trees. For our captors demanded a song from us. Our tormentors insisted on a joyful hymn. Sing, one, sing us one of those songs of Jerusalem. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a pagan land? So here's what I want us to see and think about just for a minute. Is that God's people in Babylon were at a place where they were very hopeless. And to compound that, they knew that the reason that they were there was because of their own sinfulness. I don't know about you, but I can identify with this sentiment very closely where I find myself in a place of despair and what makes it worse is, I, is, is that I know that I'm there because of my own choices. And so this is the context in which Jeremiah is speaking. Let's pick up in verse 3. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisah, the son of Shaphan and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So what I want us to see this morning, thankfully, uh, uh, mercifully, we find ourselves in the, the, the book of Jeremiah and this is a message of hope. We're going to see four things in this letter that Jeremiah sends to the exiles in Babylon that, that would have given these exiles some much-needed hope. And to be quite frank with you, this is a letter that should give all of us who belong to the Lord some much-needed hope. All right? 
So the first thing is this. If you're going to track with us this morning, take some notes. The first thing is this. We're going to see it in the letter. Um, is, that, is that God does not forget us. I want you to listen to that just one more time and let that sink in. That, that no matter where we find ourselves no matter the condition in which we find ourselves, God does not forget us. Look at verse 4. The letter said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, now first of all, notice who sent God's people into exile. It was not Babylon. It was God. And he used Babylon to do that, but it was God who sent his people into exile. But what I want you to catch in verse 4 is that they are in exile, but yet God is still speaking to them. You see that? So if we were to put that in a phrase... Just because God disciplines us does not mean that He is done with us. Like, this is hopeful this morning. In fact, if He was done with us, just think about it logically, if He was really done with us, then there would be no point in disciplining us. He would just forget us, right? But He does not forget us. A hundred years before Jeremiah, the prophet Isaiah said this. I think we have it on the screen. Yet Jerusalem says, the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. Never, never can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. Man, is this not good news this morning? Here's the second thing. Not only does God not forget us, but God cares about us, and he cares about the lost people around us. Just think about that for a moment, that God was speaking directly to his people in exile, but they were rubbing shoulders with pagan neighbors And we're going to see as this unfolds that God not only cares for his people, but he cares for the lost people that are around his people. All right? Pick up with me in verse 5. Build houses. Live in them. Plant gardens. Eat their produce. Take wives. Have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. You know what God's saying here, in all honesty? Is make yourself comfortable because you're going to be here for a while. Right? And this was in direct contrast with what some of the false prophets were trying to tell God's people. We saw that last week. Guys like uh, Hilkaniah in in chapter 28 were saying, Jeremiah's an idiot. I mean, you guys are going to be back home in, in two years or less. You know? But... But what God is telling his people through Jeremiah is you need to settle in because you're going to be here for a while, right? And, and, and man, the, the, the weight of that is that there are consequences to our sin, right? But even in the midst of those consequences, God is caring for us and he is not forgetting us. Charles Spurgeon said this, the prophet had the double duty of of putting down their false hopes and sustaining their right expectations. He, He therefore plainly warned them against expecting more than God had promised, and he aroused them to look for the fulfillment of what God had actually promised. Right? And this gets back to this theme that Dad's kind of hit on as a side note, that, that man, our, our, our ears want to hear certain things, right? But, but we, we, what we want to hear is what God is actually saying to us. But because even though we have ideas of what, what might be best for us, 
Man, as God's people, we have, to, we have to hunker down and believe for real that God actually knows what's best for us, right? He says, multiply there and do not decrease. Verse 7, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, right? You see God's care there not only for his people, but actually for the people of Babylon. He was telling his people, listen, build houses, plant vineyards, get married, have kids, give your kids away in marriage. And while you're doing that, seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. And not just seek that, but pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. I could not help but to think about, about Joseph in Potiphar's house, right? That, that he was working and working hard. He was a man of integrity, a man of faith. And, and, and God, <clears throat> God blessed Potiphar's house because Joseph was there, right? And, and God is ironically wanting to bless Babylon as hard as that's as ironic as that sounds, because his people is there, right? And this this should not sound foreign to us. This is exactly what God promised to Abraham when he established his people back in Genesis chapter 12. I will bless you and you will be a blessing. In fact, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you, and that's ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus who comes from Abraham's line. I love that how it's not just seek the welfare of the city, but pray for it, right? Paul tells Timothy a similar thing in 1 Timothy chapter 2. You can follow along on the screen. He says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people, all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Check this out. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth, right? Like, Make no mistake, God had a unique covenantal relationship with Israel. But he loved the nations. Like his plan was to use Israel to be a means by which he would make himself known to the nations. Like you cannot escape God's missionary heart from Genesis through Malachi. And obviously the New Testament as well. But it is laden throughout the Old Testament. I mean, Jesus says the same sort of thing in Matthew chapter 5 when he tells his followers to love your enemies, to, to pray for them. And I would just pause just real quick and, and ask you and ask me, do we have spiritual concern just for our family and the people that we love? Or do we have spiritual concern for our enemies as well? Because even though it's hard to think about it like this and keep this in perspective, your enemy's child was created in the image of God just like your child. And so may God help us have his heart for people. Verse 8, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord, right? I mean, he's reminding them, guarding them, um, warning them to be careful who you listen to, right? Like, don't listen to the wrong voices. And man, just like today, just like today, the people of Israel had lots of voices in their ear, right? False prophets, false preachers, but also the words of the Lord. And, and, and we, we, we face the same thing, right? I mean, we have so many voices coming. But the, man, the voice that we need to hear and lock into is God's voice. Amen? Here's the third thing. 
not only does God not forget us, not only does God care for us and care for the lost people around us, but, but thirdly, there's four of these things. Thirdly, God is just and merciful towards us. Now, now get that, that he is not just just towards us, and he is not just merciful towards us, but God is both just and merciful towards us. Look at what God's word says in verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Check that out. I mean, you see God's justice and his mercy both in verse 10, right? He's basically saying when 70 years are completed, like when the discipline, the justice is served, when the 70 years are completed, I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place, right? We see God's justice and mercy both right there in verse 10. Isn't it remarkable? Isn't it remarkable? If there's nothing else that's hopeful this morning, and there's lots of hopeful things this morning, it's, it's this, that our disobedience... Our disobedience does not keep God from keeping his word. Like God is bigger than our disobedience. That that his covenantal love towards us is unconditional. That that even when we're unfaithful, he remains faithful, right? Earlier earlier we said that, that just because God disciplines us, it doesn't mean that he is done with us. I want you to hear that again. Just because God disciplines us does not mean that he is done with us. Another way to think about this truth, you know, that God is just and merciful at the same time, is to say that God's discipline is punitive, but it's also restorative. Like it has a discipline quality, but it has a redeeming quality as well, right? The author of Hebrews makes this crystal clear. Follow along with me, this lengthy text. I'll I'll buzz through it real quick. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines who? Those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this, you know, I mean, let me, let me just, sometimes I get a chance to serve in, in the children's ministry, right? And, 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 and I'm not super gifted, especially with young kids. Like, they eat my lunch, especially if there's more than six of them. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and sometimes a kid will just be annoying or not, 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 not sitting where they're supposed to sit or being disruptive. And you know what I'm thinking in my flesh? If you were my kid, I would bust your hind end. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? But I can't, right? Because why? It's not my kid. But you better believe if it was my kid, they'd know about it, right? You know what I'm saying? And this is exactly what the author of Hebrews is saying. But verse 7, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you at all, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Like one like practical way that we can sense this or, or, or feel this in a subjective way is God's conviction, right? Like if you can sin, blatantly sin, and not feel any conviction about it whatsoever, that is a huge warning sign that you may not belong to the Lord. Verse 9, since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline, check this out, man, this is good. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in what? His holiness. Like this is a reminder that God is way more concerned about our holiness than he is about our happiness. 
No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Isn't this just a a wonderful text out of Hebrews 12? I see this even when I think about how God... How or God, how my dad disciplined, he, he thinks he's God. No, I'm teasing. Uh, how, how my dad, he does not. I was, uh, he, he would discipline me. He would discipline, and I won't even tell you how he disciplined me. But uh, yeah, I will. Here we go. Um, so I hated it, man, because, you know, he, he, would, he would send me to my room and, and not come right away, which was the worst, right? Like, I, you know, if you know you're going to get it, you might as well want to just get it over with, right? You know, and so, so he, had a, he had a paddle that he would use, right? And, and, and uh, he would sit down and, and, and talk with me. And then, and then he would have, have me put my hands on the bed. I, better not sit, I don't even know if this, you know, my dad could get, probably get locked up for this these days. I don't know. So he, my hands went on the bed, and, 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 and he, would, he would spank my hind end, right? And, and I would just puddle. And, but you know what he would do after that? Like I was crying, it, it hurt, but he would pick me up and he would hold me. He would put me in his lap and he would tell me he loved me. That's what he would do every time he spanked the fire out of me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And man, I mean, that's just such a simple, imperfect reflection of God's love for us. That he loves us enough to discipline us, but just because he disciplines us does not mean he is done with us. He picks us up, he holds us, and he tells us that he loves us. And this is our God. Amen. So let's, let's connect some dots really quick, okay? And I got to move. I got one more point. So Jeremiah sends this letter. Just think with me just for a second. Jeremiah sends this letter and it's to the exiles that are already in Babylon. A couple of waves have went. And about 10 years later, Babylon makes its final invasion into Jerusalem, levels the city, and takes the rest out, basically. Almost 50 years later, Persia rises to power and overtakes Babylon. And it's right about when the 70 years are completed. Now check this out. God providentially uses the king of Persia to keep his word that he told his people back in verse 10. Check this out. Now, this is, this is why we interpret the Bible with the Bible, okay? You don't have to flip there, but on the screen, look at Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, again, Persia was who overtook Babylon as the world superpower, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through who? Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what... King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Basically, what he's saying is we whoop Babylon's tail. That's what he's saying. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem. Cyrus is a pagan king. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem, and may your God be with you. What I want you to catch here is that Babylon did not send the Jews into exile. God sent the Jews into exile. King Cyrus of Persia did not send his people back to Jerusalem. God sent his people back to Jerusalem. Quickly, this final thing. God God is... For us, Not only does God not forget us, God cares for us and the lost people around us. What was the third point? Somebody help me. Yeah, God is just and merciful towards us. And finally, finally, God is for us. 
Pick up in verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope, right? Now listen, remember that these words are being spoken to the exiles in Babylon while they're still in exile, right? But this had to give them a ray of hope, didn't it? David Gutzik says the exiled Jews lived in the, in the experience of God's judgment upon their nation. It was easy for them to think that God was against them, that he intended evil for them. Through, the, the Jer, Jeremiah, through Jeremiah, God assured them that his thoughts toward them were of peace and that in his heart and mind he had a future and a hope for him. Now, if you are a serious student of the word, you might be thinking, rightly so, okay, does Jeremiah 29, 11 apply to me as a Christian today? Because we're, we're understanding it and we're unpacking it in its historical context. And it was absolutely a word from God through Jeremiah to the Jewish people that were in exile. And this is a fair question because this is probably the most famous verse in all of the Old Testament, right? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. You know, but does this really apply to us? Because it was written to the Jews. Now listen to what Dr. Moore, Russell Moore says about this. This is, this is really, really helpful. And then we'll kind of press towards a conclusion. Jeremiah 29, 11 must be read in the context of the whole book of Jeremiah. And the book of Jeremiah must be read in the context of Israel's story. But then all of Jeremiah and all of Israel's story must be read in the context of God's purposes in Jesus Christ. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus, their fulfillment in Jesus. If we are in Christ, then all the horrors of judgment warned about in the prophets have fallen on us in the cross where we were united to Christ as he bore the curse of the law. And if we are in Christ, then all of the blessings promised to Abraham's offspring are now ours, since we are united to the heir of all those promises, namely Jesus himself. And how can you know this? You can know it the way the exiles of old did. Not, check this out, not by observing your present condition, but by the Word of God. Listen, this is a word for me, and maybe it's a word for you. That we do not get our reassurance that God loves us and cares for us by looking at our condition. We get the reassurance that God loves us and cares for us from His Word. Because His Word never changes our conditions will, to be sure, but His Word never changes. He is faithful to it until the very end. Let me give you just a, a, a quick illustration, and then we, we've gotta, I, I've got I've to quit. When Larissa and I <clears throat> were getting close to getting, getting engaged... Um, I, I just love doing surprises. I, I'm, I'm a surprise guy. I like giving surprises. You know, we're, we're exper experienced people. We love doing things together. And so I would love, I would love to just show up at Lindsey Wilson College and say, hey, get in the car. And uh, I want to take you somewhere. And, and she'd be like, where are we going? I'm like, just get in the car. You know. It would be kind of creepy if we weren't already dating, okay? But, but we were dating, and so it wasn't creepy, okay? <laughs> you know. Um, <clears throat> and you know what? You know what? She would get in the car, and she would get in the car, in the car with a smile on her face. Because, listen, even though she didn't know what the plans were, she knew who she was getting in the car with. Like, it's way more important to know the person than it is to know the plans. 
Like we stress out so much because we don't know the plans. Why is this happening? What's next? And if you notice in verse 11, <clears throat> the Lord says, for I know the plans I have for you. It's way more important to know the person <laughs> than it is to know the plans because if you know the person and know that you can trust the person, then he'll take care of the plans. we got to finish here, verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Verse 14 says, I will be found by you, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you. Listen and see the providence, the sovereign love of God in verse 14. That he was the one that drove them out. And he is the one that will restore them. He says, I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Drew, if you're here, man, you come on up, man. I, preaching through Jeremiah, let, let, me, let me just say, first of all, I'm so happy that I'm not the lead pastor at Coral Hill Baptist Church because having the weight of preaching the majority of, of sermons through Jeremiah... It's heavy, man. It is heavy. And I praise God that their anniversary fell on Jeremiah chapter 29. Because <laughs> it's way easier to preach Jeremiah chapter 29 you know, than, than it is the, the three or four chapters before. But let me, let me say something that I, I know that you know, but I just want you to hear again. And this is why we want to be faithful to God's word in its entirety. This is why we want to preach all of Jeremiah and not just Jeremiah chapter 29. And it's this. That preaching a gospel without preaching repentance of sin is not actually preaching the gospel at all. What makes the gospel good news is that we are desperately sinful and we deserve God's judgment. But the ray of hope is that He has not forgotten us. That He cares for us. And He not only cares for you, but He cares for those people that are super hard to love in your life. That He's just and merciful at the same time. And at the end of the day, what is abundantly clear in this text is that God is for us. And if God be for us, who could be against us? Lord, we love you and we thank you for who you are. And we pray that the truth of your word would sink deep into our heart this morning. I pray that you give people faith and courage to respond in whatever way you are prompting them. Lord, we love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand with us, we're going to have a short time of, of invitation as Drew plays. And this altar's open, but we just want to encourage you to, we're not going to extend long, but we want to give you an opportunity to respond if the Lord's dealing with you in a way that, that you feel compelled to respond, either right where you sit, right where you stand, or right here at this altar.